In 2000, leaders from around the globe made a bold declaration, a promise to end extreme poverty by 2015 through the UN's Millennium Development Goals. This is a very uh, serious issue for the health of whole international community. Nine years later, billions of people remain without food or access to clean drinking water. Women and children suffer the ills of poor health, disease, and illiteracy and global food shortages, drought, and climate change threaten to slow the economic growth of recent years in many parts of the world. We've seen some spectacular progress over the, in the first seven or eight years. You know, 40 million more kids have gone to school, about two million children's lives have been saved, So, we, which is why we're very nervous that the financial crisis is going to reverse some of these gains. Will leaders follow through on their pledge to cut poverty amidst global economic decline? Next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Star Foundation, Shell International, and the European Commission. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. And now, from our studio, here's Robert Nolan. Welcome to Great Decisions. I'm Robert Nolan. Joining us to discuss the Millennium Development Goals and the impact of the global financial crisis on the world's poorest countries are Noam Younger, Global Economy and Development Fellow at the Brookings Institution and Director of the Foreign Assistance Reform Project, and Jonathan White, Senior Program Officer in the Economic Policy Program at the German Marshall Fund. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us on Great Decisions. Thank you. In 2000, world leaders gathered in New York City at the United Nations and charted the way forward for the global development agenda. They came up with what are known as the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, what, in essence, are these goals, and why should Americans care about them? Well, the goals are essentially uh, focused on reducing extreme poverty in half, uh, cutting hunger in half. And that's important in today's world because you have one billion people living on the planet on less than a dollar a day. It's important in today's world because you have now, after the financial crisis, a billion, a little over a billion people uh, suffering from chronic malnutrition. Uh, the goals also get into issues of public health, uh, look at, at trying to reduce uh, the morbidity of diseases, HIV, AIDS, malaria. Uh, they focus on maternal health and uh, child mortality. Uh, they also focus on environmental sustainability, on women's empowerment, on universal education. And all of these goals are part of what we focus on when we say global development. And it's trying to raise a bunch of countries and their citizens to a different level so that they're not living in poverty and so that they can have economic growth, opportunities, dignity, prosperity down the road. I'd venture to guess that many Americans don't even know that these goals exist. Uh, Jonathan, why should Americans care about these issues? Well, it's, it's critical that you have at a point in time in, in 2000 where nearly 190 plus countries actually uh, agreeing uh, on anything is, is not unimportant. Uh, and the, the relevance of development um, is, is, is such that it's, especially in a post-9-11 world, increasingly important because it's recognized that fragile and weak states where a lot of this underdeveloped uh, issues and challenges of, of poverty uh, and the inability of these governments to provide basic education or health services to these countries uh, are a source of insecurity. Uh, and uh, raising awareness around this is what something like the MDGs provide. Um, and so in addition to them being inclusive of both developing and developed countries agreeing on, on, on this consensus around where we go, uh, it's, it's important in the sense that it provides strategic um, guidelines for, for our direction. Um, how do we know where we are unless we know where we're going? Uh, in terms of development and in terms of um, providing for, for security for others in the world as well as for ourselves. So here we are uh, 10 years later. Uh, if you had to give a scorecard, uh, a letter grade, let's say, uh, on the progress on the Millennium Development Goals, what would it be? Well, I think that actually the, the, the issue of a scorecard is difficult precisely because uh, measuring progress is only one aspect of the actual impact of the Millennium Development Goals. So. Uh, before assigning a grade, I think it's important to recognize the, the galvanizing impact of actually achieving the goals. As Jonathan was saying, the, the, the fact that there is this consensus around a set of goals and that is global 
Uh, that has served to mobilize publicity, uh, activity on the part of citizens across the developed world and in developing countries themselves in terms of defining what they are going to work on to improve the quality of life for their citizens. Uh, and I think that that's important to recognize. So it's not just about measuring progress. In terms of measuring progress, actually progress is not going so well. Uh, there are uh, factors related to the actual process of, the, of development, and then there are also external factors such as the financial crisis, which have set back poverty uh, significantly. So for example, even before the financial crisis, uh, the region of Africa uh, was not on track to meet any of the goals by 2015. That, in my mind, would, if, if you're going to give it a midterm grade, would be a grade of, you know, D at that point. You're not sort of sealing the deal, but things are not going well. Um, I think that, in, in general, though, it's important to view the goals as uh, a, a motivating factor and to measure progress towards the goals as opposed to where you are in terms of actually achieving the goals in 2015. Because at this point, given uh, world events, it is very unlikely that the goals will be achieved as a whole by 2015. You mentioned the global financial crisis. Uh, the Great Decisions Program spoke with a number of experts on this issue, uh, specifically about how it will impact uh, the ability of these countries to meet the development goals. Why don't we have a listen to what they had to say? Our own assessment is that the number of hungry people will now go up to over one billion people sleeping hungry, uh, which has just happened over the last few months. Um, child mortality, children dying under the age of one, uh, expected to go up by about 200 to 400,000, uh, which means over a five-year period, up to three million more kids are going to die. Growth is at the center of reducing poverty. And when growth goes down uh, in the big economies, uh, it has a ripple effect all around the world. And so the poorest countries in the world are affected too. Well, the impact has been really quite severe. Um, the low-income segment and poor population have been particularly hard hit, not only by the financial crisis, but by the sort of uh, previous twin crises of the food and fuel crisis. The international financial crisis has been impacting all spectrums of our life, including major goals and objectives of the United Nations. This. Uh, Millennium Development Goals, I made a very strong case to the leaders of the world developed countries. While I would welcome to uh, see the st stimulation of uh, packages, they should never lose the sight of challenges and the difficulties of uh, many <laughs> developing countries, most vulnerable uh, people. So, global food shortages, uh, child mortality, it's a pretty grim picture. Uh, how are developing countries coping, Jonathan? Well, about 75% of the countries that are going to be negatively impacted by the financial crisis uh, in the developing world are in a position with very limited choices. Uh, they have very little fiscal space to actually provide for uh, any kind of stimulus packages that we've seen in, in the industrialized world in response to the crisis. Um, many of these countries depend heavily on remittance flows, uh, they depend on foreign and direct investment, portfolio flows, uh, and also foreign, uh, foreign aid, generally speaking, which now, given the rising unemployment levels in the industrialized world, may find it, um, it may be more difficult to actually continue with uh, addressing uh, foreign aid uh, in these countries because they're, they're facing competing um, policy choices uh, in, in the United States, in Europe, um, in terms of uh, the unemployment at home. And this makes it uh, a much more difficult environment, uh, particularly when these countries are going to be facing rising um, uncertainty, potential violence uh, and conflict in some of these countries. I mean, we've seen uh, a number of riots just as a result of the food crisis. And so the, the ability of these countries to respond needs to be addressed. And there are initiatives out there, but more can be done. And Noam, what are some of the other linkages to the global economy that are, that are having an impact on developing countries? Well, I think that uh, the point that Jonathan is making about the impact on developing countries, it's important to sort of put it in the frame of what's actually happening. And you could do it, use the MDGs. This is a, a use of the MDGs to actually look at it. For example, uh, one of the Millennium Development Goals is to focus on uh, equ equality and uh, women's empowerment. Well, in a lot of developing countries, especially, especially developing countries that are uh, very focused on exports uh, for their revenues, uh, 
in the financial crisis, those, the, the, the demand for those exports has dropped precipitously. And those countries that have put a lot of emphasis on export industries uh, mainly furnish women into those jobs. For example, in Uganda, in Kenya, the, the cut flowers industry, which is a huge part of their economy, is overwhelmingly uh, staffed by women. Uh, in Cambodia, the garment uh, sector. And this, the, there's a whole study by the World Bank that looks at the impact on women of the financial crisis. And I think that that's important to recognize in terms of looking at progress against specific goals. Um, I think that there are a lot of uh, dire signals and, and points that we could focus on in terms of the impact of the financial crisis on development around the world. Let me highlight one thing that is not so dire, and that is that um, Millennium Development Goal 8 is focused on global partnerships, and the onus is more on the donor countries to actually get their house in order, to provide more effective aid, to coordinate with each other and within their own agencies in a given donor. And I think that that's important because the actual stress on financial systems across the industrialized countries puts more of a, of a, of a point on having, on yielding greater impacts for development investments. And that's particularly important for the United States and other big donors around the world to actually be more effective with the aid that they do provide. Yeah, I mean, to add to that, I, I think that if you were able to, to make progress on greater coordination between the United States and Europe, which account for 85% of all foreign assistance to the developing world and the bulk of foreign investment, uh, as well as remittance and philanthropy flows, if you got greater coordination among those stakeholders, uh, across aid, trade, other aspects that, of, of, of uh, policy that impact uh, these developing countries, including climate change, uh, there could be tremendous benefits to all the other MDGs. Uh, it's sort of a linchpin as it relates to the other MDGs. You both mentioned the responsibility of rich nations to uh, step up and, and, and fulfill their development commitments uh, despite the economic crisis. It's, it's been a challenge, and many countries have said that, that it's been a distraction. Uh, we did speak with some other people on this issue. Why don't we listen to what they, to, they had to say? Fundamentally, they are going to um, have less resources to cope with their needs and to face the challenges of the Millennium Development Goals. And that's why we think from the European side that it is so important to keep our commitments and to keep the level of uh, engagement that we, uh, that we took. If you look at the changing international economic system, you would be better off if you have additional poles of growth, not only China and India and the U.S. and Europe, but Southeast Asia, over time Africa. And to do that, you have to invest in productive capacity. When G8 uh, made their commitment in Glenagle in 2005, uh, they pledged to provide $50 billion by 2010, next year. But half of them has not yet been delivered. Uh, therefore, I would sincerely hope that the leaders of the industrialized countries, they should uh, keep their promise. We must uh, hit the target by 2015. To me, actually, what it boils down to is that, you know, those countries who actually seriously believe and have the political will to uh, stick to their millennium commitments, they will do that through thick and thin. So, you know, because some of these countries who never kept their promise even when they were in good times are now saying they're not going to be able to keep their commitments. You know, in reality, they won't keep their commitments. But frankly, they never kept their commitments even during the time when they were in a boom period. So, you know, there's a little bit of a hypocrisy there, I think, about what really happens. So a lot of promises have been made at places like Glen Eagles and at the G20 summits. Doubling aid to Africa, for example, debt relief was another big issue that had been talked about. Uh, who's paying up? Who's following through on these commitments? It's a different situation than we were facing in 2000. Um, and, and as the commentator pointed to, there was a, uh, some of these countries weren't even fulfilling their obligations when, they were, when these were good times. Uh, there is going to be rising unemployment in the industrialized world, and there has been. And even though the, there is uh, uh, signs of, of, of growth resuscitating in the United States, Germany, and France, <clears throat> the extent to which uh, employment will catch up is, is, uh, is, is quite slow. Uh, and, and so this is a much more difficult political environment for these countries to be allocating aid. But that said, there, is a, there has been recognition both in, 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 the, in the, the following G8 commitments in Italy in this July around food security and a, um, a commitment to uh, pool together $20 billion to address food security. Um, the Obama administration has 
uh, committed to uh, doubling uh, assistance to agricultural production uh, and, and not only looking at quantities of dollars towards aid, but the, the quality of that aid, which I think is really important because if we're going to be able to improve development outcomes in a much more tighter budget environment, each aid dollar has to go farther. And so this is about coordination. This is about realizing that there are 13 different donors uh, in the electricity sector in Kabul, yet there is no electricity. There's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of waste. Uh, this needs to be wrung out of the system, and this is where political leadership needs to take place. It's not just about commitments at the G8 or the G20 about how much we're going to commit. It's taking the, the commitments and realizing them through changing the way our incentives uh, in the political system of our donors, uh, the way we incentivize aid program officers to uh, look at the outcomes and the results of aid and make those dollars go further, and where it's possible, um, find more effective methods to getting aid to the poorest. Uh, and, and re-examining programs that don't necessarily work and investing in those uh, programs that do work. I'd like to follow up on what you said about quality of aid. One common complaint that we hear uh, from the de development community is that aid is often tied to trade uh, with the donor country. Well, tied aid actually is a big issue, and a lot of uh, the donors throughout the, uh, the OECD, the industrialized countries, the group of donors, have reduced the amount of aid that is tied to their own industries back home. Uh, the U.S. has not done as much on that front, and there are political challenges to actually pushing through proposals to do more of it. For example, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration uh, pushed for uh, increasing the amount of food aid, for example, that could be purchased locally, which reduces the amount of time it takes to provide assistance to people who are desperately in need. And it also is more efficient in terms of cost, and it's more appropriate in terms of the type of food. Um, those proposals have trouble getting through the U.S. political system. There are other pressures from uh, shipping carriers and agribusiness that uh, have influence through, for example, the Farm Bill, which is entirely separate from the legislation that guides foreign assistance. And so it's a challenge, uh, but it's one that is uh, worthy of, of addressing. And Tide Aid has been a problem historically and will continue to be a problem, and it's something that donors have in general committed to reducing. And moving back to the sort of larger trade agenda, um, the European Union has been very outspoken about continuing to maintain its development uh, aid levels and for European countries to meet their commitments. The United States has been a little bit less vocal. For a while, we didn't really have anyone at the helm of uh, USAID. We've got our own problems here at home, obviously. Uh, the administration is focusing on health care and other issues. Uh, is there some disparity there between uh, the United States and our European partners in terms of advancing the sort of global uh, development agenda? No. The commitments are sometimes interpreted differently, but, uh, for example, there are more groups now that are monitoring and watching countries' commitments on the international stage. One example is One Campaign and uh, Data, which is an organization that actually monitors how well countries are doing against their commitments. Uh, as a whole, their findings are that the EU countries aren't actually doing so well in, for example, maintaining their Glen Eagles commitments. Some countries, like the UK, are actually doing very well, while others, Italy, France, are slipping. Um, and I think that uh, the US has experienced a political shift just in the last you know, recent couple years, and the, the reality is that the Bush administration focused a lot less, even though it focused a lot on development issues tripling aid to Africa, for example, creating the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, focused a lot less on coordinating globally across a whole host of foreign policy issues. The Obama administration actually approaches these issues differently. And I think you can see it already in commitments to food security, to global health, uh, to talking about the Millennium Development Goals as a matter of policy. And so I think that there is a shift, and the U.S. is actually doing pretty well uh, relatively speaking, in terms of its commitments. Uh, well, with 2015 just on the horizon, uh, global leaders are really rethinking the global development agenda. We spoke with a number of people about this. Uh, let's listen to what they had to say. I mean, this is a, an interesting year because we're, you know, this is uh, very much a time when we are doing a midterm assessment of where we are with the, uh, with the targets on the Millennium Development Goals. But, I mean, quite clearly, um, a key Millennium Development Goal uh, concerns the issue of access to basic education. Um, and that is uh, an absolute, I think, sine qua non for development. 
you're seeing uh, in in the realm of primary education, for example, some fairly good results have happened um, uh, in making progress towards that MDG, but the gender equality still very much lacks. Girls are still not receiving access to primary education at quite the same rate that, that boy children are. I think at this point, uh, we, we, we were not too bad. Uh, there, there, there were reasons to, for concern in Africa. That's, that's true. Uh, Asia and uh, Latin America were doing quite well. Uh, so in reality, we should be concentrated perhaps more on Africa. Already I would say that, you know, China and G77 and the emerging economies have much stronger ownership over the Millennium Development Goals than they had when they first came in. So 2010, you know, even as we are going to have a high-level meeting of uh, heads of state in 2010 to review the goals, and at that point we will have this conversation on what happens after 2015. I think the good news is that, that the discussions are so ongoing. You know, the, the leaders of the world are debating these issues and they realize they have to act now because we cannot lose all of the progress we've made over the last decades. So our guest there pointed out a number of the sort of positive developments over the past 10 years. Uh, what are some of the lessons that have been learned looking forward to 2015 and even beyond, Jonathan? Well, I'd say there's an increasing awareness that there needs to be greater cooperation and that the, 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 the efforts that we make individually will be only mar marginal compared to what we can make uh, together collectively um, in the sense of, of uh, there are greater commitments to, uh, in the case of this administration, as, as Noam was saying, towards working collaboratively on issues such as food security and having a more comprehensive approach, both internally, we in the United States as a nation cooperating across all the different departments where food security touches from the Department of Agricultural to uh, the United States Agency for International Development to, to other agencies, but also with our partners on the ground in these countries so that we can better align our, our projects with each other in terms of coordination, but also with the host nation who at the end of the day is going to have to uh, own these projects and have to uh, ensure that once the development aid project ends that it continues and is sustainable in the long run so that we need to consider there's a greater recognition of host country ownership and that these projects are country led uh, and that's I think something that has been a lesson a hard lesson to learn it's hard to let go and I think uh, donors are beginning to understand that if they're going to get out of the aid business they have to start handing these projects over to the countries themselves and designing our aid in new ways to allow that to happen. Uh, one issue, you mentioned it earlier, Noam, uh, that we haven't spoken too much about is the issue of gender equality. And it's one that's really central to many of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, where do we stand today on, on uh, reaching some of these targets? Uh, some of our guests here uh, thought that we were pretty far off the mark, even in areas where we've had improvement, like primary education. Uh, there's still a, a gender imbalance there. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit, uh, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a... It's a very critical MDG, uh, and in, in many ways that if we were to allow for um, greater education, uh, improved health of, of women and the empowerment of women in these societies, there are a whole host of other uh, humanitarian and development indicators that typically rise that come along with that. So there, it, it, is, it is central, uh, and if we are to, uh, to get to where we need to go, we need to be thinking about more effective ways of, of em and empowering uh, and creating the gender equality goal that the MGG set out. And, and this is not easy. I mean, in some cases, we're operating in countries where there are very um, difficult, um, uh, serious cultural differences and points of view on what that means. Um, yet it's, it's inherently seen based on a lot of uh, research and data that when we see women empowered in these countries, uh, education levels rise, uh, health uh, quality rises along with it. So it's something we can't take our eyes off of. The financial crisis has hit women harder, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, one example of that is the credit crunch actually provides a credit crunch on microfinance, which is overwhelmingly focused on women in poor countries. And so that takes its toll. Uh, the international community is actually doing more to recognize the importance of women's empowerment and equality issues. Uh, for example, the UN recently created a specialized agency focused on women. Uh, the U.S. government now has an uh, ambassador at large focused on global women's issues. The U.S. Congress, for example, also has a greater focus through a subcommittee on global women's issues. These, uh, the importance of women is coming to the fore within the broader global development discussion, and I think that that is a very good thing. Noam Unger, Global Economy and Development Fellow at the Brookings Institution, 
and Jonathan White, Senior Program Officer in the Economic Policy Program at the German Marshall Fund. Thanks for joining us on Great Decisions. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I'm Robert Nolan. To learn more about topics discussed on Great Decisions, visit our website at greatdecisions.org. Great Decisions is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Funding for Great Decisions in Foreign Policy is provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Star Foundation, Shell International, and the European Commission. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. Next time on Great Decisions in Foreign Policy. The economic crash began at home. The aftershock quickly hit worldwide. I don't know if we carry most of the blame on our shoulders, but we sure have our share of it. By late 2008, lending came to a screeching halt. What you see are the interconnections either in a spiral down or hopefully a spiral back. How has the global financial crisis hit markets worldwide? next time on Great Decisions in Foreign Policy.